Hello, everyone. For all you returning subscribers and visitors, welcome back to yet another episode of MRI Physics Explained. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. And if any of you find these helpful, then please like the videos, leave some love in the comment section, and consider becoming a member by clicking the join button below. It keeps the content coming free to you all and ensures I'll have some income once the hospital CEOs hear my jokes and take away my livelihood. On the last lecture, link above, we introduced the ultra-fast spin echo sequences including the HASTE and SSFSE sequences, where we produce echo after echo to incredibly capture all the data we need to produce an entire slice of the body in a single cycle. But I'll admit it was a bit unsatisfying. Part of it made sense. Repeating these 180 degree rephasing pulses at 1 half TE to produce a trail of echoes just like in our turbo slash fast spin echo sequences. But we did something really bizarre with our phase encoding gradients in order to keep the echoes from dying out like they normally would. So what's going on here? Maybe a better question to ask is, how does this phase encoding gradient affect our signal? Let's go all the way back to the beginning of our standard spin echo sequence and go through it again step by step visualizing what our spins and therefore net magnetizations are doing in each voxel. We start with our 90 degree initial pulse. Shown here, pushing our spins into the XY plane. Now looking down the barrel of the MRI machine as we've done in prior lectures, we see the spins initially in phase with each other as they rotate generating a strong signal in our receiver coil as shown. Let's stop here for a second and see where we are on the pulse diagram. As shown, we've applied our initial 90 degree RF pulse and generated the beginning of our free induction decay signal. Our next step is to apply our phase encoding gradient on this free induction decay. Let's go back to our animation, apply our phase encoding gradient across the Y axis and watch what happens. As we've seen before, our spins become dephased and our signal decays and is eventually lost. But it's a little different than last time. As a quick reminder, let's reset and see the same process except without the phase encoding gradient applied. Our 90 degree pulse flips our built up magnetizations into the XY plane. And they spin together, initially in phase with each other but over time the T2 effects take over, causing some to speed up and some to slow down relative to one another, and the more out of phase they get, the more our signal decreases and is eventually lost. Let's take a look at these side by side. The signal in both scenarios starts off similarly but the phase encoding gradient signal abruptly dies out here, which correlates with the time at which we turned on the gradient, while the normal free induction decay signal does its usual thing, slowly getting weaker and weaker over a longer time period without any abrupt changes. So what's going on here? Let's go back once again to the moment we turn on this phase encoding gradient. Before the gradient is applied, the only magnetic field present is B0, our main magnetic field, and therefore the protons are precessing with the same Larmor frequency, staying in phase with one another. But the moment we apply this phase encoding gradient, GY, across the Y axis, something happens. The protons in the top row see a higher magnetic field than the middle row, which is higher than the bottom row, and as always, our Larmor frequency and therefore the rate at which these rotate depend on the magnetic field these protons are in. So as long as this gradient field is applied, the protons in the top row will spin faster than the middle row, and the middle row will spin faster than the bottom row, and this will directly impact our signal. You can now appreciate that with the phase encoding gradient, we are forcing a dephasing to happen separate from the natural T2 decay dominating the second scenario, and this dephasing occurs the moment we turn this gradient on. It also doesn't affect every single proton like in our second scenario, but is spatially confined to rows within the image, thus somewhat preserving the net magnetizations within the voxels themselves. 
Now, yes, scenario number one will also experience dephasing from T2 effects as in the second scenario, but don't overthink this. Just realize that our gradient itself is causing significant dephasing even when applied early before T2 effects can muddy the waters. So we're at this point here in our spin echo sequence, and we just made a stunning realization. Our phase encoding gradient causes dephasing and degrades our signal. But wait a second. If we follow this a little further, we know at some point we're going to apply our frequency encoding gradient to our echo. How do you think that's going to affect our signal? So it would be hard to illustrate this on an actual echo, but the same principles apply if we take our previous example with the free induction decay, and instead of applying our phase encoding gradient, we apply our frequency encoding gradient across the x-axis. What do you think will happen to our spins as they precess in this scenario? Well, we will be creating different magnetic field strengths across columns of our slice this time instead of rows, with the rightwardmost column experiencing a higher field strength than the middle column, and the middle higher than the leftward column. And just like in the previous example, the rightward column of protons will spin faster than the middle column, which will spin faster than the leftward column. And the longer they spin at different rates, the more out of phase they become, once again rapidly decreasing our signal. So this brings us to the dirty secret of gradient fields that no one talks about. Anytime we apply a gradient field, we cause signal dephasing. And the stronger the applied gradient field and longer it's applied, the greater degree of dephasing that occurs. So going back to the standard spin echo sequence, when we apply a phase encoding gradient, we decrease the signal. When we apply our frequency encoding gradient, guess what happens? We decrease our signal. What about the turbo slash fast spin echo sequence? All of these applied gradient fields decrease signal, decrease signal further, and more, and more, and more. So are we doomed? Forever saddled with this catch-22 of needing more gradients for better image quality, but each gradient in fact degrading our signal and picture? Let's take a step back and remember the mechanics of these gradient fields. They're created by placing two coils across the axis of interest which function as electromagnets when electricity is run through them. And depending on the flow of electricity, we can create these linearly varying magnetic fields across the slice as shown. And that's the key point. We control these gradient fields. So here's an interesting question. We cause this dephasing by applying the gradient field shown. What happens if we now reverse the current running through these electromagnets, thereby reversing our gradient field across the x-axis? What do you think will happen to the precession of these spins now? Let's find out. We expect them to again process at different speeds across columns, and something fascinating happens. The longer they spin, the more in phase they become, which makes our signal re-emerge, growing stronger as this echo. Now the reality is this isn't perfect. As always, there will be some inherent losses and disorder that we'll never be able to recover. So more realistically, it should look something like this. But regardless, we've been able to make our signal re-emerge, and if we turn off this gradient at this point, the protons now experience only the main magnetic field B0 and once again rotate in unison. So anytime we apply a gradient field, we cause signal dephasing, or rephasing, depending on the timing and direction of the gradient. This is an incredible relationship with profound implications. Going back to our spin echo pulse diagram, this means that we actually don't need this 180 degree rephasing pulse to produce an echo. Nor does this 90 degree initial pulse need to even be 90 degrees, it can be less. We also don't have these time constraints, having to wait for one half TE for a rephasing pulse. So how do we do this? How do we produce this echo using only gradients? Well, unfortunately, we can't do it as currently depicted. We still need this phase encoding gradient to produce our picture. And remember the phase and frequency encoding gradients are being applied across different axes of the slice. But what if we do this? We apply a reverse frequency encoding gradient here, at the same time as our phase encoding gradient, which quickly dephases our free induction decay signal. And then, rapidly reversing our frequency encoding gradient back to its normal direction, allowing our protons to rephase and our signal to reemerge as an echo. So this, folks, is called the Gradient Recalled Echo, or GRE for short. And for once, it's a pretty good name, right? It perfectly describes what we're doing here. 
So let's compare our newly christened gradient recalled echo to our standard spin echo sequence. Starting at the beginning of our pulse sequences, we noted that our initial RF pulse in the GRE sequence is often less than 90 degrees, while we start our spin echo sequences with a 90 degree initial RF pulse. Check out the dedicated lecture on the spin echo sequence, link above, for the explanation of why this needs to be 90 degrees. So putting this into our chart, the GRE sequence starts with a pulse typically less than 90 degrees, while the spin echo starts with an initial pulse equal to 90 degrees. Also, the spin echo sequence requires us to apply this 180 degree rephasing pulse at time 1 half TE to produce our echo, while the GRE sequence does not need this rephasing pulse. We produce our echo by rapidly applying and reversing our frequency encoding gradient as we just showed earlier in the lecture. But wait, what about this rephasing pulse? We spent so much time and energy discussing the importance of this and how it allows us to greatly improve the diagnostic quality of our images by recovering some of these non-random T2 star effects. So this is a critically important difference with our gradient recalled echo. Notice that in the GRE sequence, the direction these protons are rotating never actually changes. We are simply inducing dephasing with our gradient field and then recovering it with our reversed gradient field to produce our echo. Whereas in the spin echo sequence, our echo is generated by applying this 180 degree RF pulse at 1 half TE. inverting our protons and causing a reversal of their rotation with respect to the receiver coil. A much different method of rephasing. So the consequence of having no rephasing pulse on our GRE sequence is that we're unable to recover these non-random T2 star effects. Meaning, instead of getting pretty pictures like this, our pictures have poor contrast to detect most pathologies and are severely degraded in the presence of any paramagnetic materials, poor magnetic field uniformity, or chemical shift, which is a problem in most cases. Unless this is exactly what we're looking for, mainly hemorrhage shown here within the right thalamus. This is the classic use of a GRE or SWI sequence, taking advantage of the fact that microhemorrhages, which are paramagnetic and invisible on other sequences and imaging modalities, on a GRE sequence will disrupt the magnetic field and lead to signal dephasing or dropout. Pretty ingenious, right? So this inability to recover non-random T2 star effects on the GRE sequence is both a negative and a positive, depending on the information you're trying to get out of the image. The spin echo sequence has that rephasing pulse so we can recover some of these non-random T2 star effects, which we generally desire more as it gives us better image quality. A few more things to wrap up the lecture. As it stands with this basic GRE sequence, we run into the same problems with imaging time that we encountered with our standard spin echo sequence. Namely, in order to generate an image, we need to repeat this cycle at least 128 times. Not optimal. So for the instance of the spin echo sequence, we spent a dedicated lecture pioneering this turbo fast spin echo technique where we generated multiple echoes in a row by repeating these 180 degree rephasing pulses at 1 half TE. So it's reasonable to say, hey, can we do the same trick with this GRE sequence? If we repeat these dephasing and rephasing gradients after the first echo, can we make a second echo emerge and save imaging time? And the answer is yes. We call this technique multi-echo GRE, but there is a big difference. In this turbo slash fast spin echo technique, we can generate these long echo trails because each 180 degree rephasing pulse is injecting new energy into the system. But in this multi-echo GRE technique, there is no new energy being injected into the system, so we cannot make long echo trains. We can only generate a few echoes before it runs out of steam and there's so much disorder that our signal is lost. So while this is limited, it has found a little niche in in-phase and out-of-phase imaging. So we have limited ability to generate additional echoes in the GRE sequence, but not in the case of the spin echo where we can generate long echo trains. So take home points for this lecture. Gradient fields cause dephasing and rephasing. 
we choose the timing, strength, and polarity of the applied gradient fields. Therefore, we control dephasing and rephasing, and thus the echo. This is an incredibly important point that I think clears up a lot of confusion. When we talk about the time point TE, we make it feel like a magical point where the echo just decides to reemerge at some time we're beholden to and forced to have to work around. But as we alluded to in the Haste SSFSC lecture, we can actually shift the echo around. And you can bet a big factor of this are the strengths of these gradients when we choose to apply them and for how long. If we apply a really strong reversed frequency encoding gradient on our free induction decay, we know this will cause increased dephasing and therefore more rapid degradation of our signal. We'll also need to apply a strong rephasing gradient. And if we change the gradient parameters enough, we could shift the entire timing of this echo. And now that we've realized we have some control over this dephasing that occurs with gradients, let's go back to our spin echo sequence and see if it can be improved. We now know all these gradient fields will cause dephasing within the slice, the phase encoding gradient, the frequency encoding gradient, and even the slice select gradient. And this will degrade our signal and image. Is there anything we can do to reverse the damage we've done with these? How about the slice select gradient? We've drawn them as these full bars for now for simplification, but in actuality, it should look like this. We apply the gradient in one direction during the RF pulse and then immediately reverse it once the slice is energized to recover the dephasing we caused. The phase encoding gradient we're stuck with, we need this dephasing to build our image as previously covered. But what about the frequency encoding gradient? We know we're going to apply this gradient throughout most of the echo. That's also going to cause dephasing and degrade our signal, right? So let's preemptively attack it. Before the echo emerges, let's intentionally cause some dephasing in the opposite direction with a reversed frequency encoding gradient that will then recover during our normal frequency encoding gradient when applied while recording the echo, giving us a bigger echo as a result. Pretty ingenious, right? This is the true form of the spin echo pulse sequence diagram. People often leave these extra gradients out for simplicity because it just leads to confusion if you don't understand gradients and how they work. But now you do, so you can confidently interpret these in the future. So again, gradient fields cause dephasing or rephasing. We choose the timing, strength, and polarity of the applied gradient fields, and therefore we control the echo to some degree. If you take home one thing out of this lecture, it's this. So we have pioneered a way to produce an echo without a rephasing pulse and manipulate the echo along with it. But it still seems limited, doesn't it? Despite all of this, it's not very efficient, and in order to build a picture, we're going to have to repeat this at minimum 128 times. And as we know by now, imaging time is money, and if there's one thing that will get hospital CEOs to invest in their radiology departments, it's the threat of not having enough money to pay for their private jets. So are we forever destined to this slow gradient recalled echo sequence? Does the story of the GRE end here with a few micro hemorrhages, or could we potentially borrow some elements of the spin echo sequence to create a Franken sequence to load our CEO's jets with so much money they'll have to dump some before it can take off? It won't go to your Christmas bonus, by the way, but probably their backup private jet. On the next episode of MRI Physics Explained, things get even crazier as we introduce echo planar imaging. Thank you for all of those that support this channel, and if you found this video helpful, here are ways those new to the channel can show some love and support as well. That was a good one, right? We'll see you on the next episode of MRI Physics Explained. This is Dr. T.E. signing off.